It is a Canada that is not as we knew it. A Canada whose power base has shifted from Ontario and Quebec to the West and the suburban middle class. This is John Ibbotson's Canada, and he joins us now to tell us more about these changes, which he outlines in The Big Shift, which he co-authored with pollster Daryl Bricker, and it's great to have you back here at TVO, Mr. Ibbotson, sir. Good to be back, Steve. I always think it's hilarious that we talk about the Laurentian consensus with you, because you are <laughs> it personified, but anyway, you are describing its uh, demise here, and here's our first quote from the book that we're going to read. The Laurentian elites don't realize that Canada no longer belongs to them. A country that was once part of the Atlantic world is becoming part of the Pacific world. The provinces that mattered most don't matter as much anymore. The country's center has shifted west and power has shifted with it. In fact, power is now shared by two groups, Westerners and Ontario suburban middle class, especially the immigrant suburban middle class. In terms of power and priorities, nothing else and no one else is as important. As we unpack that, because you've had a few visits here to tell us about the Laurentian consensus, give me your best 30 seconds on what that is and then we'll go from there. Well, it, it, you're right. It's, first of all, this book exists because of this TV show, so thank you for that. A little over a year ago, I was asked to give a speech uh, for the Big Ideas series on what was happening in Canada. And I had been bothered by the fact that a lot of us were misunderstanding what had happened in the 2011 election that gave the Conservatives their majority government. And it seemed to me that's what was happening, that there had been a great shift in power. And that shift was advantaging the suburban middle class who were in common cause now with the Western uh, voters who had always voted Conservative. But the West was growing. It was more powerful. Uh, there were more people. There was more wealth. And the Laurentian uh, elites were? And the Laurentian elites, they were the, and are, the political, academic, business, cultural, and media elites in basically Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal, who had run the country for most of the country's history by consensus. They debated the big issues, they reached a consensus, they implemented that consensus. And by the way, they created a great country. We owe them a lot. But they had been losing power, first of all to the suburbs, second of all to immigrants, the two Torontos that we have brought into this country in the last two decades, and to the West. And that this shift was permanent and it was big. And that was the speech. And a couple of months later, Daryl Bricker phoned me because he'd seen the speech uh, on YouTube, I think. And he said, you know what? You're right, but you have no data. I have data because <laughs> Daryl is the president of Ipsos Reed Public Affairs. Mm -hmm. We ought to do a book. Um, and he took it to HarperCollins and HarperCollins said, yes, but you only have six months because political ideas have a short shelf life. So um, even, that, the, even when they're permanent? Uh, even when the shift is permanent, uh, the idea of the shift uh, yeah. is ephemeral. So uh, we wrote it. Uh, it came out last week, and uh, it's, it's doing really, really well. And, and again, we have, we have you to thank for it. Very provocative blue flag, blue Canadian flag on the cover. Uh, would the uh, Ottawa Bureau Chief of the Globe and Mail be part of the Laurentian consensus? We, one of the things that we say in the introduction of the book is that we're committing treason <laughs> sure. uh, against our own class. Not necessarily against the country, I hope, but yeah, we're, we're a couple of Laurentian elites living in Laurentian neighborhoods. But one of the things that started all of this was after the election, Daryl and I talked a fair bit, uh, even did back then, and we both agreed that everything we were reading, everything we were watching on television about what was happening was wrong. It was about the false Harper majority, about the Conservatives, you know, lucking into or perhaps, you know, fraudulently grabbing uh, a majority government. And they weren't realizing that, no, this Conservative majority government, whether you like it or hate it, is the product of big tectonic plate shifts going on inside the body politic. And it's not going to go away. It doesn't mean the Conservatives win this election or that election, but it means suburban immigrants in the 905, in alliance with the West, are dominating the policy agenda of the country, and that's going to go on for a long time to come. So we thought, well, why don't we tell our, our brethren uh, in the Laurentian elites that, well, you know what, we don't matter anymore, and it's time we realized it. Do you feel bad about that? No. Uh, it's not that I don't like the Canada that the Laurentian elites created. In fact, I love the Canada that the Laurentian uh, elites created. I love especially the multiculturalism that they created. The fact that we did open our doors as no other country on earth has opened its doors to so many people from so many places. But they're not the people who came here, for example, after the Second World War. They're not the people like my ancestors who came uh, after the First World War. They have different priorities, different interests. Some of them are different from mine. But what I love is the fact that they are seizing the country and they are seizing the agenda and they are driving us forward. And, and I do believe it is forward. I love the idea that the West is no longer a region, that it's the new center. I love the fact that Canada is becoming a Pacific nation rather than an Atlantic nation. There are things that I regret, uh, uh, but essentially I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist especially 
but the fact that these new immigrant Canadians are embracing the country and driving a kind of a nationalism, a patriotism even, that our generation was embarrassed ever to embrace. So on the whole, I think it's a good thing. If you're thinking about, though, the ease or relative difficulty of governing the country, and this is one of the hardest countries to govern, just, you know, very few people, a lot of space, um, is it harder now to govern the country if the center of gravity is not where the Laurentian elites hang out and used to hang out, but rather the West, suburban, exurban Ontario, and essentially that's it. But one of the things that the Laurentian elites themselves always believed was that Canada was fragile. It could break up at any moment. It's ungovernable. It's like a hummingbird. You know, it can, theoretically can't fly, and yet it does. Um, so, yeah, there's a shift in power. Yes, one region that used to be peripheral is becoming central. But that doesn't make the country any less governable. It's going to make changes, absolutely. One of the things that we talk about in the book is what we call the Ottawa River Curtain, where everything east of the Ottawa River, Quebec and Atlantic Canada, they are not bringing in immigrants. They're not even trying very hard, frankly, to bring in immigrants. Their populations, in consequence, are aging and declining. Their economies are aging and declining. And the assumption that the Laurentianists always maintained, which was that there would be interregional transfers of wealth from the richer part of the country to the poorer parts of the country, I don't think that's an assumption that these immigrant Canadians themselves embrace. They want to know why. Why is money going to these people? Why are seasonal industries considered so important? Why must the equalization program be what it is? So there are going to be challenges, and there are going to be tensions, and there are going to be stresses, but we've never been farther away from a Quebec referendum on separation than we are right now, even with a PQ government in Quebec. And I think it cannot weaken the country to have the West now not only in, but running the place, a region that it was itself. Uh, considered to be on the periphery at one time. Okay, let me follow up on Quebec. You say there is the potential for a conservative, big C conservative renaissance in Quebec. And, uh, you know, obviously you, you guys are taking a big hit on this one because nobody else sees it. Where do you, what do you see that no one else sees? By the way, it's, it's a mini renaissance. We're not <laughs> arguing that they're going to, you know, sweep 40 or 50 seats. But they can do better than five. You can hardly do worse than five. Right. The argument that we think is this. Quebec is moving away from questions of national identity to questions of income and wealth and prosperity and equity. The students on the streets weren't, weren't banging their pots for a sovereign Quebec. They're banging their pots for a progressive version of, of, of greater economic uh, prosperity. We think that there can be a conservative reaction to that. That, you can go, that the Conservatives could go into Quebec and say, yeah, we know you don't love us, and we know that uh, we, we don't say all the things you want us to say, and sorry about that business with the Queen and putting Royal in the <laughs> Army and in the Navy and Air Force. But we're not corrupt, and we focus on economic growth. I think in some parts of Quebec, there could be a limited appetite for a, 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 a government that preaches law and order, that preaches clean government. Whatever else you say about the Conservatives, they are not... Uh, they have not yet been caught with their hands in the cookie jar, um, and that preaches um, a, a sort of an economically conservative, minimal regulations, less uh, intervention by the state inside the province. It could resonate, at least with some Quebecers. Well, you say they're not corrupt, but... Okay, let's put this up. This is from the book. Say what you will, no one has yet caught a conservative politician guiltily grubbing, grubbing around inside a cookie jar. A pork barrel, yes, especially in Tony Clement's Perry Sound Muskoka riding. Election shenanigans, quite possibly, in Guelph and elsewhere. But no one has gotten rich by being too well-connected conservative. The government may be dictatorial, Philistine, and anti-democratic, but at least it's clean. Uh, you know, really? I mean, you see all these shenanigans going around with the Senate, people trying to, you know, kind of milk the system for every last dollar they can. And you don't think this is like bordering on malfeasance? I don't think that the travails of the Senate reflect directly on the Harper government, partly because there are liberal senators as well as conservative senators who may or may not have been uh, fiddling with where they were actually in residence. The more important point is that Harper has been trying to reform the Senate, to create an elected Senate with term limits. Some of his own conservative senators, by the way, are stymieing those attempted reforms. That's why he's kicked it over to the Supreme Court to let them have a run at it. But fundamentally, Harper is on the side of the Senate reformers, and his legislative record uh, is on the side of the legislative, uh, Senate reformers as well. And, and by the way, this sounds as though, both here in, and in the, in the Quebec arguments, as though this is a pro-conservative book. And, and there has been some criticism of the book as being an apology for the conservatives. It isn't. We believe the conservatives understand what's happening to the country. We think Stephen Harper is surfing the wave. 
uh, better than the Liberals or the NDP are. But we also argue in the book that there is a progressive response to this, and progressive parties can, in fact, come to power, but only if they understand the fundamental demographic shifts among the immigrants in the suburban parts of Ontario and, and, and within the West that are now governing the country. I want to ask about that coalition. How do South Asian immigrants living in Toronto's suburbs have anything in common with white rural voters or Westerners? Because that's the coalition, I gather, right? I guess the alternative coalition uh, is what you want to pose as an opposite. In fact, when we first had this debate a year ago after the speech, John Duffy, sitting on this set, argued that you can find a way to bring Ontario voters back into coalition with Quebec voters, maybe even against the West. We don't see that. Those suburban immigrant voters in the 905 are from China, are from India, are from Philippines, are from Pacific nations. They are themselves here uh, succeeding and wanting to succeed, succeed more. Those values are far more in alignment with the values in Calgary uh, and even Vancouver um, and even Winnipeg, uh, which is actually going gangbusters these days, than they are with the notions of redistributive income, protection uh, of uh, de declining and diminishing populations and economies in the West. I don't see how you get 905 immigrant voters to make common cause with Quebec and Atlantic voters. I see every reason why they would make common cause with Western voters. And in fact, I see every reason why Ontario because of immigration, is becoming what we call a Pacific and not an Atlantic province. Hmm. Okay, one more quote from the book here. Canada's Aboriginal leaders must be aware that their ability to influence the national agenda in their favour will only ebb with time. The big shift is shifting with them too. If they're not aware of this, someone should tell them. Uh, John, you know, Aboriginal issues have really been quite front and centre, actually, over the last six months or so. The Idle No More protests, Chief Spence's hunger strike. Do those things, in some measure, undermine the argument you're trying to make here? No, I think they reinforce it. It's inter interesting we wrote all this before Idle No More. Um, and Darrell phoned in the middle of it all and said, call them and tell them we want to break, we, you know, add another chapter. <laughs> What we're arguing, and I think, think we're seeing it reflected in the uh, native population as well, is that the traditional assumptions of, of responsibility and guilt that the European settler populations rightly feel for what happened to the Aboriginal populations is not shared by the two million odd immigrants who've come in here in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. They come from societies that were oppressed by colonial powers or that were cruelly treated by colonial powers. So there's empathy with First Nations saying, yes, we know exactly where you're coming from. Our own ancestors, our own parents uh, endured it as well. But there is no sense of responsibility among themselves for that, nor should there be. And so what we're saying to the Aboriginal community, and especially to First Nations leaders on reserve, is that you, whatever deal you're going to get, whatever rights you're going to achieve, whatever settlements you're going to, you're, you're going to manage with the federal government, get it now. And maybe listen to the younger generation of leaders who are coming up and saying, you know what? It's not just about grievance. It's not just about entitlements. It's not just about land claims and treaty rights. It's also about health care and education and then economic development on reserves because this is the argument that's driving the country forward and is driving the country forward increasingly on First Nations territories as well. So what we're also looking at in Idle No More is a civil war that's taking place within the Aboriginal population over where its emphasis should be. We're saying the younger ones, the ones who are worried more about making sure that the next generation of Aboriginal Canadians has the same high school graduation rates as the last gener as, as the rest of the population does, and not the 60% plus failure rate that we have now. Those are the ones who are going to be listened to, and those are the ones who are going to make common cause with those immigrant voters in the 905. And I guess eight years from now, when there are two million more immigrant Canadians living here... Two more Torontos. Two more Torontos. The chances of those communities cutting themselves a better deal seems unlikely. Exactly. That's what we're saying. Actually, it's one more Toronto. We're getting our math wrong. We're saying yeah. one Toronto every 10 years. Right. But we're saying every, every decade, a new largest city in Canada joins the country, hmm. all from third world countries, mostly from Pacific and Asian countries. And every, uh, with every decade, they exert more influence at the provincial level, at the municipal level, and at the federal level. And the courts can defend the, the, the constitutional rights of First Nations. Of course they can. But judges read newspapers too. Over time, 
the population becomes impatient with this argument, with the, impatient with these demands, then the federal and provincial governments will become impatient with them too. Hmm. John, why do you hate Maritimers so much? <laughs> don't we love Maritimers? Mm, I don't know, John. I read the book. I don't know if you love them. You call, what, what's that expression you use? They, they live in the Atlantic Canadian alternative reality the, universe? The Atlantic Canadian reality distortion field. Reality distortion field. Because? Where, because among, not all of them, but among too many Maritimers, there is this belief that, for example, well, our economy is seasonal. Therefore, we work for part of the year, and the federal government pays our income for part of the year. And Daryl Bricker did focus groups back in the Cretchen days, and he'd say to them, I want you to think about the, the Oakville commuter, who takes an hour to get into work and an hour to get home, uh, who's never taken unemployment in her life and who never will take unemployment in her life. Why is a portion of her income going to you? Is that right? Should that be? And they pondered for a moment and go, well, yes, that's the Canadian way. It's, it's sort of Marxist. Those who have give to those who need. And it's not just us. We have three senators arguing for maritime union. We have Scott Bryson, uh, the Liberal MP, saying that the economic trajectory of his region is completely unsustainable. These governments are going to become insolvent. They're, because they don't bring in immigrants, their populations are aging. Their young people are leaving. These are chronic problems, as you know, have been for decades. But they're accelerating. And there are walls. And you hit them doesn't mean that seasonal workers are, are lazy or anything like that. Lord, my job doesn't involve me risking my life when I go out to catch fish. Hmm. But that doesn't change the economic fundamentals of the place. And it doesn't change the fact that, again, new Canadians are going to increasingly wonder why the, the maritime provinces can't put themselves on a self-sustaining economic basis. Okay. In our last five minutes here, I want to hit you on the, not physically hit you, but let's discuss, I guess I should say, uh, what I think has been one of the most controversial aspects of the book. And Finally, one more excerpt. Something fundamental is happening. Politics in Canada is dividing along ideological lines, and those divisions will grow only sharper over time. We believe that fortune favors the Harper government in the next election. But we don't believe this is about the next election. We believe it is about the next decade, the next generation, and beyond. We believe that the Conservative Party will be to the 21st century what the Liberal Party was to the 20th, the perpetually dominant party, the natural governing party. Uh, all right, I understand the argument based on everything you've told us so far, but I mean, surely you've watched politics long enough to know that no theory can hold up to any government that screws up and gets itself unelected because of its own stupidity, and that can happen, right? It can. As we also say in the book, uh, we've woken up too many mornings and tried to explain the misprognostications of the night before. Any government can win or lose any election, including the election in 2015. What we are saying is the, the demographic fundamentals favor the Conservatives, and the issues favor the Conservatives. Actually, not the issues. There's just one. There's the economy. It, because of the recession, uh, and because immigrant Canadians are ups, uh, rightly focused on you know, improving the quality of their own lives, improving their own incomes, improving the, the chances for their own children, the economy is the issue that trumps all other issues. When the economy is the one and only dominant issue in the uh, electoral landscape, there is a tendency to divide between a center-right and a center-left alternative. Right now, the center-right alternative is united. Less government, lower taxes, less regulations. By the way, right now, an arg a, a worldview that appeals to those suburban middle-class 905 voters. The other side is split uh, between the NDP and the Liberals, and as yet has not come up with the coherent response that is attractive to those 905 suburban and Western voters. And what we're saying is, until, first of all, they can get their act together and, and unify and stop splitting the vote the way the right split its vote so much in the 20th century. And unless and until they can find a way to take the economic argument away from the Conservatives and say, no, we have a better way of doing it. We have a way that makes Westerners want to vote for us, not for the Conservatives. We have a way that makes suburban middle class voters in Ontario want to vote for us and not the Conservatives. As, until they can do that, yes, any election is a crapshoot. But over the long term, over the long haul, Fortune favors the Conservatives. Have you seen anything over the last couple of weeks from the Liberal leadership race, which has seen Justin Trudeau sign up an awful lot of new supporters to bring to the convention in a few weeks' time, that might change this calculation at all? Well, it's a, you know what? It's like John Duffy's here as a, as a non-existent participant. It was <laughs> John who said that Justin Trudeau would be the first post-Laurentian Liberal leader. And what John meant by that was he thinks that Justin Trudeau understands this argument that he understands that the Liberal Party has to appeal to those middle class 
uh, or suburban voters, especially those middle class immigrant suburban voters. He recognizes that the West can no longer be just a place that the Liberal Party writes off. At least he recognizes it in theory. Uh, does he recognize it in reality? Um, that may be the case. There is one other thing that Justin Trudeau is doing, though, and I wrote about it just this, earlier this week in the Globe. He is uh, attracting the millennials. Barack Obama is president of the United States because he got an entire generation of voters who don't vote to vote. The millennials, those who basically under 35, who in 2008 made up 17% of the electorate, they cast 18% of the ballots. That's not happening here. Uh, the younger voters in Canada just aren't voting. So a politician of the left or the right who can galvanize the millennials has an important uh, leg up in, in any long, again, in any long term race. Uh, whether Trudeau can do that in the long term in a vote in an election as opposed to a leadership campaign, I don't know. But yes, the potential is there. And how about uh, your advice to the Liberals and New Democrats on whether they need to do anything more formal? We say that in one way or another, the progressive movement has to unify. That it, there's only two ways for that to happen. That is, one way is for the two parties to cooperate, to unite, to merge. It takes a very long time to do it. It, can, it may not, I don't think, in fact, it can possibly be done. Of conservatives, 10 years. In terms of the conservatives. And that was one party mm -hmm. coming back together again, right. at, that it was in schism. This is two parties. Or one of these two parties has to win. In other words, it has to push the other party down to a marginal third party status, such as the NDP had in, in much of the last half of the 20th century. One of those two things has to happen before the progressives can take on the conservatives on anything like a level playing field. One last thing, John. Has, has anybody come up to you in Ottawa, in your travels, and said, you know what? You are absolutely full of crap on all this stuff. It's a great theory, but you're just full of it, and we're not buying it. Well, we've had a couple of reviews <laughs> that say <laughs> much the same thing. And our response is, fine. Where's your data? How are you going to convince Ontario voters to vote with Quebec voters to supplant uh, the, the, the West and suburban Ontario? How are you going to account for the growth of the West? Do you really think you can recreate 1968, 1974, and 1993, where you marginalize the, most, the wealthiest and fastest growing part of the country? What are you going to do about those 30 new ridings that are getting added to the House of Commons in 2015, half of which are in suburban Ontario and half of which are in the West? What are you going to do about all that? Where is your data? Show me your data, uh, and Daryl might be interested. Show me your theory, and I might be interested. But don't just tell us ain't going to happen, things are going to go back to the way they were, because we don't think things are going to go back to the way they were, and we've got the data to prove it. Yes, you do. It's a great read, John. Congratulations again. The big shift, the seismic change in Canadian politics, business, and culture, and what it means for our future, and what it's meant for our present, is a very pleasant interview with you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John Ibbotson. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.